Amen. For those of you who don't know, I started teaching last night from a PowerPoint the first time in my life, and uh, it was awkward to say the least. I did a little bit better this morning. Tonight's going to be my last time. Praise God. I get cut free tomorrow. I can minister out of what's in my heart. But I've been sharing things that I wanted to uh, give statistics and things that, you know, aren't in the Bible. And so it's not in my heart, but yet I felt it was important to say in defense of the gospel. We started talking the first night about, you know, um, everything being apologetics. The word apologia is where he says every man needs to be able to give an answer of the hope of the calling that lies within him. That Greek word is apology. It's where we get apologetics from. And the Lord really impressed on me that I need to just start teaching on foundational biblical principles so that people who hear me will have a biblical worldview. And so we talked about that. And this morning I was talking about how important it is to believe that the Bible is not a book about God, but that it's a God-breathed book that people wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And we gave a number of things on that. But the number one thing in my life, when I at one time doubted the inspiration of the Word of God, I'd been listening to critics and stuff. And the one time that I doubted it, the thing that really won me over was prophecy. And we talked a lot about that. And I went through it very quickly. There was no way that you could get it all. But hopefully it gave you uh, an impression that the Word of God just cannot be a normal human book because of the number of prophecies just concerning Jesus, 300 plus prophecies that Jesus fulfilled down to the last detail. I mean, down to the fact that they took his garments and cut some of them and others they cast lots for it. That was predicted nearly 500 years in advance that people wagged their, his, their heads at him, that he was pierced uh, and nailed and just on and on and on it went. So anyway, that's what we've been talking about. Tonight, I want to deal with uh, creation versus evolution because this is an area that there are a lot of Christians that have just given this over to the devil. They really believe that science has proven creation somehow or another. And because of that, if you believe that evolution is real, you cannot believe in the biblical account of, of creation. And I know that there's some people that say, oh, no, that's not true. But, you know, the very first five words in the Bible, in the beginning, God created. It did not evolve. It was created. And I know that some people will say, well, there was an original uh, creation that Satan ruled over. Matter of fact, one of my friends has a series entitled Jurassic Earth. And he believes that in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that there were billions and mil billions of years and that Satan ruled over a kingdom and then the earth was recreated and that's what we have listed here. But anyway, that doesn't fit. I, I'm not even going to teach on that. That would take all night to teach on that, but I do not believe that that's what the Word of God teaches at all. Creation, as described in the Bible, is incompatible with evolution on a number of different uh, levels. But let me just say this, that Charles Darwin is the one who popularized the theory of evolution. It goes back all the way to the time of Jesus. I've actually read some things, and there were people back during the time of Jesus that were preaching evolution. But it was... It was uh, not a mainstream doctrine. Charles Darwin, who was the son of a pastor, is the one who came up with this and popularized it. And it has been the catalyst for turning just about every despot in the uh, last 200 years towards Satan and towards doing the things that they're doing. For instance, look at this right here. This is Karl Marx. And he lived 1818 through 1883. He wrote to LaSalle in January 16, 1861, Darwin's book is very important and serves me as a basis in natural selection for the class struggle in history. Karl Marx dedicated a personal copy of his book, Das Kapital, to Charles Darwin, inscribed that he was a sincere admirer. Of Darwin, of course. For those of you who know Karl Karl Marx, he was the one that uh, popularized a lot of the communist, socialist things. 
Darwin also influenced Margaret Sanger. I'm going to talk about her more in a minute. Frederick Engels, and he's the guy that co-authored the Communist Manifesto with Karl Marx. He lived in Manchester, England. Vladimir Lenin, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, and Pol Pot. All of these were people that through their doctrines that basically Darwin inspired, uh, they killed millions, hundreds of millions of people, and the thing that justified it was evolution. And so uh, Darwin published his book, Origin of the Species, 1859, Descent of Man, 1871, and, and look at some of these statements from Darwin. It says, with savages, the weak in body or mind are soon eliminated. We civilized men, on the other hand, build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed, and the sick. Thus the weak members propagate their kind. No one who had attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of man. Hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed. That's Charles Darwin. Here's some other things that he said. Civilized races of men will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, as we hope, even than the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon instead of is now between the Negro or the Australian and the gorilla. The Supreme Court used Charles Darwin and they quoted him in this decision, Dred Scott versus Sanford. This was in 1857. This is the Supreme Court decision that ruled that uh, uh, Negroes were not humans like other people. Here's part of that deal. It says, slaves had been regarded as beings of an inferior order, so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. That was a doctrine that came specifically from Darwin. They quoted that in the Dred Scott case. Here is Margaret Sanger. She lived 1879 to 1966. She was voted the humanist of the year in 1957 and she promoted eugenics and forced sterilization to eliminate inferior races. And she founded Planned Parenthood in 1939 for the purpose of eliminating the Afro-American race in America. That's what Planned Parenthood was formed for. Here's some of her statements. She said, the lower down in the scale of human development we go, the less sexual control we find. It is said the aboriginal Australian, the lowest known species of the human family, is just a step higher than the chimpanzee in brain development. She wrote in her book, Pivot of Civilization, 1922, calling for the elimination of human weeds overrunning the human garden for the cessation of charity because it prolonged the lives of the unfit for the segregation of morons, misfits, and the maladjusted, for the sterilization of genetically inferior races. And specifically, in many of her writings, she pointed out that the African Americans were the genetically inferior. That is the purpose of Planned Parenthood. And I don't have this stat, uh, statistic in my presentation, but I've read it, and I forget the exact number, but it's like 10 times as many Black baby, black children have been uh, aborted as all of the other races combined. That was one of her goals was in starting the Planned Parenthood. And in 2000, uh, 2017, the U.S. House and Senate continued to fund Planned Parenthood with $543.7 million. Richard Nixon, uh, Title X, uh, thing that he passed is the one that started the funding of Planned Parenthood back in the 70s, I think it was, and this last year, 543 million went to it. This Ernest Rudin was a uh, German, and he was quoted by Margaret Sanger, and often uh, she um, loved the policies of the Germans during World War II that went to eradicate inferior races, 
And this Ernest Rudin advocated eliminating those with hereditary defects. And I can't pronounce this German word, maybe so under, anyway, it means a person considered racially or socially inferior from the human gene pool, which led to millions dying in the Holocaust. And every one of these quoted from uh, Darwin. Joseph Stalin. It says the, the, the book, Landmarks in the Life of Stalin, read that at a very early age, while still a pupil at the ecclesiastical school, Comrade Stalin developed a critical mind and revolutionary sentiments. He began to read Darwin and became an atheist. And then this is Stalin's statement. There are three things that we do to disabuse the minds of our seminary students. We had to teach them the age of the earth, the geological origin, and Darwin's teachings. Stalin went on to say uh, in this order 00447, he called for the mass execution and exile of socially harmful elements as enemies of the people, and they estimate that he had between 8 and 61 million people that he killed. Mao Zedong said Darwin influenced him, and he said Chinese socialism is founded upon Darwin and the theory of evolution. Mao Zedong's atheistic communist party policies resulted in an estimated 80 million deaths inspired by um, Darwin. Pol Pot, the communist premier uh, Khmer Rouge killed two million Cambodians in his killing fields between 1975 and 79. And he quoted Darwin and uh, believed that some humans are more involved, evolved than others. So here's a statement, if the fruit is bad, the root is also bad. Jesus said this, Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt for the fruit. The tree is known by his fruit. Luke 6, 44, for every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. So I believe that I can truthfully say that Darwin influenced every um, despot of the entire uh, late 1800s, 1900s, on up into the 20th century, if the fruit is bad, the root is bad. So here's some statements by our own presidents and how they summarize the dis differences between the East and the West. It says, America is a new nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That was Lincoln. Uh, FDR said... Uh, on United Flag Day, 1942, the belief in man created free in the image of God is the crucial difference between ourselves and the enemies we face. Eisenhower said, he um, stated on his return from Geneva Conference, July 1925, I mean July 25th, 1955, the wide gulf that separates so far east and west lies between the concept that man made in the image of his God and the concept of man as a mere instrument of the state. You know, that could be expounded on a lot more, but the moment you take away God being created by God and accountable to a God and you make him just an evolved person, that takes away responsibility. It takes away morality. Morality is relative because there is no God who established right and wrong. We are just evolved animals and we have as right to choose as anybody else. That is a major deal right there. Psalms chapter 36 verse 1 says, The transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. You know, when we see these shootings that are happening and things like this, people say, man, what have we got to do? We've got to have more mental health things. We've got to have gun control. And I've often said this, that guns don't kill people any more than forks make people fat. You know, they just had a person last week that went into a birthday party with an ice pick and killed at least one. Uh, uh, I think there was a three-year-old or something that was at this birthday party. Are you going to take away all ice, pick, ice picks? Are you going to take away all knives? Are you going to take away all forks? Then people will use bats. I'm not saying that there isn't, you know, sense, common sense things to do, but everybody's looking for these other things. The problem is that there is no fear of God, and evolution facilitates that.
because God didn't create things. We just evolved. That's the reason that people like this. And I'm going to go through a lot of things. And I know that some people may still disagree with me. You're entitled to your opinion, but I'm not going to agree with you or we'd both be wrong. I'm telling you that I'm going to go through some things. And if you will follow the reasoning, evolution does not make sense. It is not accurate. And the reason that people are so adamant and fight for this so strong is because it takes away responsibility. It takes away this fear of God that is a restraint upon evil. It also says, Proverbs 16, 6, it says, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. If people are living evil, evilly, I guess, how you'd say it, then it's because they don't have a fear of God. And that all comes back to us being created in the image of God. Eisenhower also said, Man is created in the divine image and has spiritual aspirations that transcend the material. He also said Milton asserted that all men are born equal because each is born in the image of his God. Our whole theory of government fi uh, finally expressed in our declaration said man is endowed by his creator. When you come back to it, there's just one thing. A man is worthwhile because he was born in the image of his God. And that is basically how he summarized the difference between the East and West. And did you know that that basically could be said today? It's the exact same thing. He went on to say the things for which the Americans stand are those things which enrich human life, which ennoble man because he is an individual created in the image of his God and trying to do his best on this earth. When you separate us from a creator and make us our own God, where we establish our own rules. Everything is relative to what our time is. Man, it, is, it destroys society. If the fruit is bad, the root is also bad. And again, those are the verses that I've already quoted on that. So once you reduce a man to an evolved animal, all of the restraint is removed. And brothers and sisters, this is what we see happening in our society today. And, uh, you know, I was, again, interviewing Butch and... Uh, Julianne Hartman last night on our Truth and Liberty broadcast and I had to be nice because I didn't want to get them in trouble for what I said but man I, I, I have a major bone to pick a dislike of our media and entertainment type of thing because you know they come out and they have this hashtag me too movement and they criticize Harvey Weinstein and they come out and they talk about how terrible this is. I think that is so hypocritical that they empowered a person to produce all kinds of profanity, all kinds of immorality. I mean, they took all of the restrictions off. And these people who are now falling by the wayside, they are the ones that promoted all of this ungodliness. And then when they act ungodly, everybody is shocked. And yet that's what their whole life has been about. They have corrupted and polluted the American mor morals through uh, basically, mainly, I would say, through our media stuff. That's what they promote. And then we expect them to act differently than all of the junk that they put out. Now, I'm not endorsing any type of sexual harassment. I think if you harass somebody sexually, you ought to nuke them till they glow and shoot them in the dark. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not promoting sexual harassment. But I'm saying that it's like these people who are so ungodly and they are pushing homosexuality and adultery and all of these ad, ad, uh, you know, ad immoral doctrine. Then they all of a sudden are so shocked that somebody would say something unkind to a woman, that somebody would grope her or do something. And yet that's what their whole life has been about. If the fruit is bad, the root is bad. If this is what these people produce, I can guarantee you that's what's in their heart. And it doesn't matter how they mask it and portray themselves. I, it's just, it's illogical. It's illogical the way our society is wanting to promote every type of immoral action that you can possibly promote, and yet they want those people to live in a holy manner. That just defies logic. Again, Psalms chapter 31, 36, 1, Proverbs 16, 6. I've already quoted them. The fear or reverence of God must be removed for evil to triumph in a person's heart and evolution 
facilitates that. Again, if you were to go back to every one of these people, Margaret Sanger justified it because of Darwin's teaching. Mayo de Zon, de, or however you say his name, he killed 80 million people because of Darwin's thing. Hitler used Darwin and quoted Darwin. Stalin did. And every one of these, sing, every one of these people were emboldened because of the doctrine of evolution. I tell you, if something has produced that fruit, you need to reject it lest the same thing happen to you. And yet, did you know among Christians, again, I don't have this slide up here, but among Christians, I forget the number, but there are a huge number, close to 50% of Christians that believe in evolution. It's not true. They say, but there's theistic evolution. God is the one that caused evolution. He caused it over millions and billions of years, but it was God ordained. God started it. And so they believe in theistic evolution is what they call it. That is not compatible with the Bible. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. This says that sin is a, re our death is a result of sin and one man, Adam, brought sin into this earth. This answers that question about the gap theory and that there was a civilization prior to Adam and Eve and that's where all the dinosaurs came from and there, that's where all of the long age of the earth came from. No, because this says Adam is the one who brought death and sin into this world. And all of evolution is dependent upon millions and billions of years of death and mutation and changing into some other species. And according to the Bible, death did not exist until Adam brought it in. It was the wage of sin. So evolution, even theistic evolution, however you want to try and change it around, is incompatible with the Bible. It is not what the Bible teaches. Somebody says, well, what about science? Hasn't science proven all of this? No. Science hasn't proven it. Matter of fact, Evolution is not science. And I'm going to give you some quotes by some of the greatest scientists that have ever lived that show you that science is, that evolution is not science. It just isn't true. It is not a proven fact. It's a theory. And there are literally thousands of scientists who debunk evolution, not from a faith perspective, but from a science perspective. So here's one cosmologist. William Lane Craig, he said, I think it's indisputable that there has never been a time in history when the, hand, when the hard evidence of science was more confirmatory of belief in God than today. Alan Rex Sandage, who is the world's greatest obser observational cosmologist and Jewish-born former atheist who is now a committed Christian, Sandage received multiple awards worldwide for his work, including astronomy's equivalent of the Nobel Prize. He said, it was my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be explained by science. It was only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. That is a Nobel or the equivalent of a Nobel Prize winning scientist saying that. Robert Jastrow is an astronomer and physicist and former agnostic. Ja Jastrow was a former NASA scientist and received the NASA's Medal for Exceptional Scientific Achievement. He also served as a professor at Columbia University and Dartmouth College. He said the essential element in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis is the same. The chain of events leading to man commenced suddenly and sharply, had a definite moment in time in a flash of light and energy. In contrast to this, Carl Sagan, the atheist, he said trillions of planets with life like Earth, one million in the uh, Milky Way galaxy alone. He made claims like this and talked about surely there's other people out there that there's millions of planets. Listen to this, Arno 
Penzias, or however you say his name, 1978 Nobel Prize winner in physics said, astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying and one might say supernatural plan. And Jimmy Davis and Harry Poe said, uh, science educators and authors of this Designer Universe book said, rather than being one planet among billions, Earth now appears to be the uncommon Earth. The data imply that Earth may be the only planet in the right place at the right time. Man, this is contrary to so much stuff that you hear, but these are scientists saying this. It is wrong to say that scientists, they have a consensus among them. It's not true. There are thousands of scientists that have debunked evolution on the basis of science. John O'Keefe, renowned NASA astronomer, pioneer in space research, and author of the book, God and the Astronomers, said, we are by astronomical standards a pampered, causated, which uh, I looked that word up and I forgot now what it means. <laughs> but it's, it means unique, something like that. Did it, anybody know what it means? Anyway... He's a, an astronomer. That's the reason he can get by talking that way. <laughs> anyway, um, we are by astronomical standards a pampered, causated, cherished group of creatures. Our Darwinian claim to have done it all ourselves is as ridiculous as a char and charming as a baby's brave effort to stand on its feet and refuse its mother hand. If the universe had not been made with the most exacting precision, we could never have come into existence. It is my view that these circumstances indicate the universe was created for man to live in. Sir Fred Hoyle, internationally known physicist, knighted by the Queen for his work in physics, said, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intelligent has monkeyed with physics as well as chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Man, those are awesome statements. This Vera, whatever the last name is, professor of physics emerita in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, and former president of the Association of Women in Science says the exquisite order displayed by our scientific understanding of the physical world calls for the divine. Patrick Glenn, Harvard-trained physicist and former uh, arms control negotiator for the Reagan administration, a former atheist and now a committed Christian, said, ironically, the picture of the universe bequeathed to us by the most advanced 20th century science is closer in spirit to the vision presented in the book of Genesis than anything offered by science since Copernicus. And here is Werner von Braun, the father of modern scientists. He was a German. He's the one that developed the U-2 rocket for Hitler. And uh, he put basically uh, warfare at a whole different level. You know, towards the end of the Second World War, I forgot the exact number, but Hitler fired thousands of U-2 rockets. And it was something that the Allies didn't have an answer for, but it was just too late in the war to make a major difference. And as the war was ending, he and other German scientists, they had to escape to the American side rather than the Soviet side. And the reason he did it, he said, was because this was going to put warfare in a brand new category. And he only wanted people, um, he, is, he broke his arm as he escaped. But here's what he said, I myself and everybody you see here have decided to go west. And I think our decision was not one of expediency, but a moral decision. We knew that we had created a new means of warfare in the question as to what victorious nation we were willing to entrust this brainchild of ours was a moral decision more than anything else. We wanted to see the world spared another conflict such as Germany had just been through, and we felt that only by surrendering such a we weapon to people who are guided by the Bible could such an assurance to the world be assured. That's, that's interesting. It was, it was providential that God had him and all of his fellow German scientists defect to the U.S. So he immigrated to the U.S. 1955, became a U.S. citizen, and he called it one of the proudest and most significant days of his life. In 1958, he launched America's first satellite, 
He worked on the U.S. guided missile program, was the director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, um, and he is considered without a doubt the greatest rocket scientist in history. These are not my words. I'm taking these from other things that I've read about him. He wrote, and man, I've got, I think it's either five or six pages of quotes by him, and I'm, I've got so many other things I want to share. I'm going to have to skip through some of this, but basically he just came out and said there has to be a creator. And he's the one that said anybody who claims to be a scientist and will not allow creation to be taught is not a scientist because science considers all options. And he says people who claim to be evolutionists are narrow-minded. They are rejecting. There are so many inconsistencies that they aren't able to explain, and yet they won't accept anything else. And he, he said a lot of great things. Maybe you're able to read some of those as I was looking at this. Um, I think I'm going to skip through a lot of this, but man, it is really good. I put five pages worth of quotes in here. Uh, many men who are intelligent and of good faith say they cannot visualize a designer, and he goes on to say that that's the problem. They just can't see him. They can see an electron, and well, they can't see it, but through an electron microscope or something, they can get a concept of it, and they can build a model but they can, they can relate to something that they can't see because it can be conceptualized. But he says you can't conceptualize God, and that's the reason that man has rejected that. He says, what strange rationale makes some physicists accept the inconceivable electrons as real while refusing to accept the reality of a designer on the ground that they cannot conceive him? Well, these are some great things that he said. He said, I'm afraid that although they really do not understand the electron either, they are ready to accept it because they managed to produce a rather clumsy mechanical model of it borrowed from rather limited experience in other fields, but they would not know how to begin to build, uh, begin building a model of God. Scientists now believe that in nature matter is never destroyed, not even the tiniest uh, particle can, can disappear without a trace. And he goes on and talks about if, that, if we believe that about matter, how can we believe that people just cease to exist? And he said some great things here. I'm, again, having to go through a lot of this. Got a lot of things I want to cover. For me, the idea of creation is inconceivable without God. One cannot be exposed to the law and order of the universe without including that there must be a divine intent behind it all. And um, again, there's just some great, great things here. Praise God. The last thing here, uh, speaking for myself, I can only say that the grandeur of the cosmos serves to confirm my belief in the certainty of a creator. And so... This is the leading rocket scientist that we've ever had, but you know what? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to come to the conclusion that there's a God. So let me show you some things. I've been doing fire mitigation at my house. This is where you cut all of the branches below 7, 10 feet uh, for fire. They call it ladder fuel. The grass will burn, but the trees won't burn if they don't have these branches to climb up and burn the trees. So here's a picture I took Saturday at my house. These are some trees, and I want you to notice that there are branches all the way down to the bottom. This is the way trees naturally grow. And then I got out, and I did fire mitigation. That is the exact same picture from the same spot after two and a half hours worth of work, and it looks different. And this is what it looks like when I cut off those branches. And let me just say, without being a rocket scientist, if you were to come to my property... And if you were to see these trees right here trimmed up to 15 or 20 feet, and then all of the branches are stacked over here in a pile, and if you walked up and says, man, this must have evolved over millions of years. How dumb can you get and still breathe? This doesn't happen naturally. Did you know that what you see here doesn't happen naturally? And yet, these so-called educated men can't see this. That just defies logic to me. It is crazy. 
Psalms chapter 19, 1 through 4, The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter his speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone forth through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Notice it says that every day is speaking and that this speech has gone to every corner of the earth. There's not a single language that doesn't understand creation. Creation is shouting at us that there is a creator. You know, you could take the cumulative power of the human race, all of our money, our resources, the smartest man, and they couldn't produce one blade of grass. They could produce something that'll look like it, could taste like it, but it'll never reproduce. It'll never make another blade of grass. If mankind on purpose with all of our resources and intelligence can't do the simplest thing, how in the world can we believe that all of this order happened accidentally? Did you know I've actually read things that if you were to take a uh, Boeing factory that makes 747 planes, and if you had all of the pieces and parts of a 747 plane. I just flew on one not long ago and I read this. I forget now the exact number, but it's, it's something like a hundred or something miles of cables in one plane. And if you took all of this stuff and if you put a bomb in there and it exploded, the chances of those parts coming together and forming a 747 plane that can fly are about one billion times more likely than life coming from chaos. If you were to take a bomb and put it in a printing press or in a printing shop, and if it was to explode and make all of the pieces come together and print a Bible, multiple Bibles, and bind them with everything in perfect order and stacked and shrink-wrapped, it's billions of times more likely that that would happen than the evolution would happen. Evolution does not make sense. It takes faith to believe in evolution, and it's because people do not want to be accountable to a creator. There are scientists that are refuting it. Every person who's ever lived on this planet had a witness of creation shouting at them, but there are none as deaf as those that don't want to hear. People who believe in evolution want to believe in evolution. It's convenient because it takes away accountability to a creator. So instead of it being Christians who are blinded by faith, it's evolutionists that are blinded by faith. They aren't looking at the facts. You know, the tooth, tooth that was used in the swope, uh, or, or however you say that, monkey trial, 1925, did you know uh, that they said that this was some prehistoric man and they used one tooth to prove evolution? <laughs> and it turned out that that was the tooth of a modern man. Did you know that evolution has to constantly reinvent itself because the things that they've said prove not to be true? Did you know the jawbone of the, I think, Neanderthal. I'm not sure I'm getting all these things right, but the jawbone that they used to so-called prove uh, evolution turned out to be the modern-day uh, jawbone of a donkey. And they just constantly have to redo these things and refigure uh, everything. Did you know that they predicted that when man landed on the moon, I remember this, they predicted that there was going to be so much cosmic dust from the billions and billions of years that the uh, lunar uh, rover would sink in the sand. That's the reason they had these tires that were this big trying to give it traction. Did you know it turned out there was less than two or three inches of dust on the moon indicating a young earth or a young moon instead of the ancient time that they talked about? And they've been proven wrong a million times, and yet they just still keep believing it. You'll hear people cite modern examples of evolution. Matter of fact, I had somebody just ask me this question last week on our Bible study that we do every Tuesday night. And they said, but what about the modern-day examples we see of evolution? There are no modern-day examples. And they'll say, but oh, you've got these... Uh, bacteria that are mutating into a new strand that are drug resistance. That's evolution. No, it's change within a species. Evolution is dependent upon one species becoming another species. You know, there are, um, 
Five times in Genesis chapter 1 where the Lord said He created all of the animals after their kind and told them to reproduce after their kind. There is no such thing as one kind, one species becoming another species. Again, they'll cite bacteria, but it's still bacteria. It's just able to adjust. I've heard people talk about people that live in real high altitudes, and this, this is true here. You know, some of you are breathing hard since you've been here. But because I live here, after three weeks, your blood begins to start producing more red blood cells. It carries more oxygen, and your, and your lungs actually expand. That's the reason they put the U.S. Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs is because you train, and it helps you when you go compete at low altitude. So you can adjust. There are ways that you adjust, but a person doesn't become a dog or a horse, or vice versa. You can adjust. A species can adjust to different changes and things like that. You can live in a warm climate to where you get to where I, we say that your blood is thin. I don't think that's really what it is, but you get to where you're used to the heat and you can't stand cold. You can live in a cold place where you can't stand heat. You can adjust to things, but you don't become another species. And again, evolution is dependent upon not just one change, but billions and billions of changes through mut mutation. Mutations, you can observe any mutation that happens in, uh, in animals or people, and it is never positive. It's always negative. Mutations do not improve anything. It always makes everything worse. And yet evolution is bent upon mutations accidentally happening over billions of years, and every time it works out for good. Man, if you believe that, I got a bridge I'd love to sell you. <laughs> In Genesis 121, God created great whales, every living creature that moveth the waters brought forth after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And we could just go right on through all of these. All of these are stressing that it's after their kind. There is no example of things changing uh, from one species to another. And even metamorphosis, where a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, did you know that that disproves evolution? Because evolution says it takes millions and billions of years for this to happen. It, take, it happens in a day or two or a week. These caterpillars morph and become a butterfly. And the second law of thermodynamics says that everything in the universe goes from order to disorder, from complex to less complex. Did you know if you leave these drum sets up here, if you leave anything up here on this platform and you come back in a thousand years, it's not going to be more organized. It'll be disorganized. If you take a bunch of flowers and lay them out on a table, you could come back for thousands, millions of years. They'll never organize themselves into a flower arrangement. Everything that we observe in nature goes from complex to less complex, from organized to disorganized, and yet evolution reverses this, that everything from came from total chaos into such complexity that man has never figured out all of the things that God has created. It is against one of the laws of science, the second law of thermodynamics. And people will talk about the geologic column. That proves that the uh, earth is ancient and old. You know, uh, Dr. Grady, I mean, uh, Dr. Carl Ball, his Creation Research Museum in Glen Rose, Texas, I've been there. But anyway, he has uh, samples of the geologic column. And I've actually held artifacts in my hand, a little cup that was made in a spoon that are in the lowest column that are supposed to predate humans by over 100 million years. And we have artifacts of people in those layers. We have trees uh, that have been fossilized uh, that are through hundreds of millions of years, supposedly, of the geologic column. You don't hear about this often, but you can go find it. And it's consistent. Also, did you know that the exact same layers, they call them the Precambrian layer and all of this stuff, did you know that the entire earth has these exact same layers over it, implying that there was something like a worldwide flood? Because it is worldwide. You can find the same layers at the same altitudes all over the world. Now, they've also had, uh, you know, the... Uh, 
the effects of volcanoes and stuff that push them up. But I'm saying you look in a flat place, it's consistent all over the world like a worldwide flood was. I've seen fossils at the Creation Research Museum where it has a human footprint in a dinosaur print that's about this big. And did you know that one of the leading evolutionists told Dr. Carl Ball, he says, if these are real, this completely disproves evolution. But you know the way they get around it? These were found back in the early 1900s, but during the Great Depression, a man started carving these footprints because it was famous in Glen Rose, Texas, and a man started carving them to make money during the Depression. And so there is a newspaper article about that, and they will just immediately say, see, this was all uh, man-made, it's not real. But Carl Ball excavated them himself, and he's had compression tests done on it, and they show that the material was not carved out of like a solid rock, but you can see the compression where the print of the dinosaur was there, and there is a human print on top of it. Matter of fact, he's actually excavated, and you can see human footprints and a dinosaur coming along, stepping across on top of them, and the human footprints went over to the side and stopped and knelt down, and the dinosaur prints went by, and then the man started walking and walked in them. And so, again, that completely disproves evolution, but people choose not to believe that. And so Dr. Carl Ball is a friend of mine. And also this radiometric dating, they've actually done radiocarbon dating on a living mollusk and it proved he was 3,500 years dead. <laughs> Did you know radiocarbon is based on the theory of evolution? They believe evolution and because they have this mindset, then they come to these assumptions and use this to date things and it is circular reasoning is what they call it. It's wrong. It's not accurate. People say, well, then what, how did all of this happen? How did the Grand Canyon happen in all of this? Man, this Dr. Uh, Grady McMurtry, I interviewed him on my television program. He's an all, uh, Australian, and he's got some great material. You know, there's so much material. I'm talking as fast as I can, and I'm not halfway through this thing. Uh, you need to go research this on your own. But Grady McMurtry, Dr. Carl Baugh, of course, Crea um, uh, Ken Ham, and we've had him here, or his son, I think it was, it was here. And um, but there's a lot of material on this. But Grady McMurtry shows that there was one continent at one time, they call it Pangaea, and all of the earth was together. And when Noah's flood came, it says that the waters clave and he shows where the rift, the continental rift, where they've got maps that show this and it goes literally around the world. It started around the time, place where Israel is and it went down through where the Suez Canal is and then it split and one went over towards India, the other one went around South America and you can see this, it's on any map. They have these rifts and things like this. And that's the water from underneath the earth came up. And that's where Noah's flood came from. And the Grand Canyon was formed by there was a huge natural dam as the waters uh, receded that covered a lot of Arizona, Colorado, Utah, multiple states. It was gigantic. And these soft layers that were laid down during the year of Noah's flood when that dam broke, it flooded these soft layers and that's what formed the Grand Canyon. It did not take millions and millions and billions of years for that to happen. Amen. I know that everything I'm saying is so contrary to everything you see. If you walk right out here, we've got a little uh, post out here that says 20 million years ago on this exact spot, absolutely nothing happened because God had not created the heavens and the earth. Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980 deposited, it was 75, I've got 70, but it was 75 feet of ash in 72 hours. And I've seen pictures of it. I've got it in one of the other presentations of something that I've done. And it, it shows all of these different layers. And yet we know because we were there that it was deposited in 72 hours. But if you were to take one of our brainy evolutionist and they were just to happen to walk by and see this, they would say, see this proves. Look at the different columns. Here's the Precambrian layer 
and yet all of that happened in 72 hours. Actually, we had a flood right here back in, I think it was 99 that we had our 100-year floods, and they had a place out here not very far from here that it, it wore a 20-foot uh, gully through rock in one night, the flood. And people say, oh, no, that takes... Again, you have to have a predisposition that things only erode one centimeter every 100,000 years. And if you believe that, well, then you look at so many centimeters of things and you say, this proves it. But you have to have a preconceived belief to go along with that. The water's clave. Uh, man, that's powerful. You know, the silt built up at all of the rivers. Uh, every river in the world, the Nile... The Mississippi, you can look at all of them. And if things have been here for billions of years, there should be huge amounts of silt. There's only about 4,500 years worth of silt built up at the mouth of any river in the world. And these things, I'm, I'm not just saying this. You can go and find this, but people just uh, conveniently miss this. The gravitational pull of the earth is decaying at a constant rate. It's decreased 7% over the last 130 years that they've measured it. If you were to extrapolate that and go back, well then, if you were to go back anything beyond 10,000 years life as we know it couldn't have existed on the earth because of the consistent decay of the gravitational force. Same thing is true with the moon. The moon is moving away from the earth at a given rate of speed. And if you were to go back much over 10,000 years, the earth and the moon would have been touching. This is science. It's not a scripture that I'm quoting. The distance of the earth from the sun is unique. You heard some of these scientists talk about that. It's precise. If we were any closer, we'd burn up. If we were any further away, we'd freeze. Our atmosphere is unique. You know, the more I hear about stuff and read it, it, it just is amazing. It is beyond human intellect that anybody could have figured out the complexity that we have. And yet, all of this complexity and evolutionists believe that a single chromosome, which has over 3.2 billion nucleotide pairs in each chromosome, just happened accidentally. That's not smart. <laughs> Again, Psalms 19 says, Every, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord, and every person on this planet has had this. You know, over in uh, Romans chapter 1, I'm not sure if that's on this. Yeah, here it is, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man who owe the truth and unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, Notice the terminology, it's manifest in them, not to them. There is an intuitive knowledge on the inside of every person. For God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, I had one of my employees here a few years back who heard me teach on this exact verse and he was raised in an, a family that were all atheists, and he was taught that there was no God. And he came up to me, and he challenged me on this. And he says, you know, I respect you and everything, but he says, this isn't true. I was raised not to believe that there's a God, and I never had any conviction of God until he was like 20 or 30 years old and got born again. He says, that's just not true with me. And I said, it is true with you. And he says, how can you say that? I said, because I believe the Bible more than I believe you. I said, this is what the Bible says. Every sin, every disobedience, every person who's out there saying, I don't, nothing's wrong with homosexuality. Nothing's wrong with being a transgender. It's a lie. When I was in Vietnam, I had lots of people tell me, I'm an atheist. But there are no atheists in foxholes. When the bullets got to flying and the bombs got to drop and all of these atheists were crying out to the God they didn't believe in. It's a mind game. The Bible says every person has had God reveal himself to him. So this man, he said he was praying about it, and as he prayed about it, the Lord reminded him when he was like 10 or 12 years old, he lived in L.A., and he climbed up on a hill to watch the sunset, and as the sun set, he started seeing lights come on all over L.A., millions and millions of lights. And he was just thinking how much effort this was that every one of those lights had to be placed there and wires had to be run 
And each one had to have a bulb screwed in. And he was just thinking about the millions and millions of people that did this and all of the effort. And then he says, as it got dark, he just lifted his eyes up to the heavens and he saw millions of stars and he had the thought come to him. If all of these lights down here had to be placed there, well, then who made all of these? And he said it just came back to him and he realized he had those thoughts but he just pushed them down and rejected them. There's not a single person that's ever breathed on this planet that didn't know that there was a God and that they weren't him. God has revealed himself to every person. But Romans chapter 1 goes on to talk about how you can deaden yourself to this. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that you can sear your conscience with a hot iron and you can become reprobate. And the last stage of being reprobate, according to Romans chapter 1, is homosexuality. Once a person crosses that line, that's the last step. And man, we see that being promoted and pushed on us today. And I tell you, it's dangerous once a person begins to go that far away. And so that's the scripture I was referring to. You can sear your conscience with a hot iron. There are no atheists in foxholes. So there is no way to make peace between the Bible and evolution. It just does not fit. It's in, incompatible in more ways than what I have time to say. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the Bible is accurate. And there, that's not popular. People today are saying, oh, no, science is proven. Science hadn't proven anything. Again, it's people that are burying their heads in the sand. You know, this Answers in Genesis, they put out a magazine. I get that. And it is phenomenal, the the um, scientific things that they have now that they're coming out with. And I mean, it is, it is phenomenal. This is not just a, a religious thing where we are burying our heads in the sand. Science it has not disproven creation at all. Matter of fact, science has led many, many people into a belief in God. And like I said, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You know, I was out walking in the, uh, we live way out in the woods, and I was out walking on a place about a mile from my house, way back in the woods. People hadn't been there in forever, it looked like. And I came upon these sticks that I was looking at them, and they were so deteriorated that it was hard to tell. But then I got to look at it, and they formed a perfect rectangle. And so I got to digging around, and did you know underneath them were little concrete blocks? And probably in the 17 or 1800s, somebody had built a cabin there. Wow. And it was just so unusual to see a perfectly laid out rectangle. And then I can guarantee you those concrete blocks weren't on all four corners accidentally. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, somebody built this. <laughs> and yet, if you just were to walk by, it looks kind of natural. But you don't have that kind of order. I've got 26 acres on my property, and I've walked every inch of it, I look, and I've never seen any of my trees form a perfect rectangle with <laughs> concrete blocks under the corners. You know, if they were to land on Mars, and if they found a house built there, I guarantee you the evolutionist people would be so excited. This proves there's life on another planet. They would be promoting it to high heaven. And yet a house isn't alive. It can't reproduce. It isn't near as complex as a physical body. It, did you know a worm is more complex than a house? It can live and reproduce and produce another worm. <laughs> Algae is more complex than a house. And yet if they were to see some kind of a building, they'd say this proves that there was at least some time life on Mars. And yet they can look at all of this and can't figure out that there's a God. There is a demonic opposition against the Creator. And it is not just science or something like this. There is a predisposition in people. I quoted these verses this morning, but Jesus said that light has come and men love darkness more than they loved light and they fought against it. People are fighting against creation because that would verify that there is a creator that would put a fear of God in them. 
and that would restrain their sin, and they don't want to be restrained. They want to live in sin. It's really that simple. This is demonic. The Scripture talks about three or four times in 1 John that there is a spirit of Antichrist that's already at work in the world. Today, we call it political correctness, but it is a demonic spirit. It's a spirit of Antichrist, and it is warring against everything biblical because the Bible brings accountability to God. The Bible says that we were created in His image. In the beginning, God created, and the fear of God will restrain man from living in sin, and they love their sin, and therefore they are resisting the restraint. They see you and I as people that cramp their style. You know, if people really wanted to be homosexuals, why don't they just be homosexuals and quit holding parades and bragging and trying to make everybody accept them? It's because their own conscience, just like Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, in their heart, they know it's wrong. Their heart is condemning them and they're trying to overcome this conviction. I'm telling you, it is essential that we come to a biblical worldview, a biblical way of looking at things. And if you buy into evolution, then based on the things that I've shared tonight, you cannot believe in the accuracy of the Bible because the Bible is not compatible with evolution. It says God created in six days. And somebody says, well, what about a day is as a thousand years and stuff, even if you say it's a thousand years and six thousand years, that does not justify death coming in and millions and billions of years. I believe it's just exactly what it's talking about. There's so many other things that we could bring into it. Did you know that granite, which this place right here, this is built on decomposed granite. Did you know granite has a half life? It's got the radioactive things in it. They call it radon. And it's got a half-life of less than one second, one thousandth of a second, which means that if granite formed in any longer than one thousandth of a second, all of these radioactive particles would have escaped. It formed, boom, like that in less than a second for all of this radon to be trapped in this granite. And on and on and on you can go. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the Bible is accurate. It was written by a man who spent 80 days, 40 days with no food and water, down from the mountain one day, went back again 40 days with no food and water, 80 days in the presence of God, talking to God directly, so much so, so that his face shone, and he's the one that wrote all of this. He got it firsthand from God. God told him, how he did all of this. I just choose to believe somebody that spent 80 days in the presence of God until their faith shone more than a person who can't see that there is a God that created all of this complexity. And I do not feel like a fool for believing the Word of God. The Scripture says, Psalms 119, I believe it's verse 99 or 100 right around there. It says, I have more understanding than all of my teachers because your word is my meditation day and night. Have you got that up there? And then look at verse 100. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. I'm telling you, walking in the word of God is wisdom. God's word is true. And we've got people today who are mocking it and making Christians feel like they are somehow or another ignorant and I, I guarantee you, there are none as ignorant as people that can't see God. The heavens are shouting at us every day. Every day. You know, I, I may be different than most people, but I was looking out here not long ago, and with the smoke that's in the air, you can see all of this smoke in the air between us and Pikes Peak. But on a clear day, I was thinking, you know, you can't see anything, and yet... That air, it's not empty space. That's how a plane is able to fly. It's, it, that air is holding it up. And anyway, I, I just think about air. Air is awesome. <laughs> this atmosphere that surrounds this planet keeps meteors from impacting us and destroying us. It burns up, it, it uh, 
filters out rays, not as well as it did before the fall, and that's the re I mean, before the flood, and that's the reason that the lifespans decrease. But still, even after our fallen earth and things, the wisdom of God in creating this. I was looking at a bird yesterday flying and thinking that is just absolutely amazing that these birds do this. Did you know that birds fly thousands of miles and come to the exact place? I've been to San Juan Capistrano in California and they come back every year on the exact same day to the exact same place from over 2,000 miles away across the uh, Pacific Ocean. Did you know that the monarch butterfly, and I just read this in our local paper, which our local paper is a little bit suspect. <laughs> so I'm going to present this as maybe. <laughs> but they had an article on the monarch butterfly. And did you know that the monarch butterfly, like for instance, they are born in California and live and die, but then their seed goes to Mexico. And then they live and die down there. And then their seed comes back to California. They didn't even return to some place where they were born. They went back to a place that their ancestors went to. How do they have this in them? How do they navigate? If you can't see God in that, you know the Bible many times, look, go to the ant, you sluggard. And look at that. It talks about the coney. It talks about all of these things. The Bible talks about this. Creation is just shouting at us. And if you can't see God in creation, how dumb can you get and still breathe? I know that many of us have just blindly accepted things because it is said so often. But I challenge you to think. I challenge you to go to the Word of God. I challenge you to believe that God's Word is inspired. And it's not just an allegory. It's not symbolism. It's not man writing about God. And take what the Word of God says, and I guarantee you God's Word is more up-to-date, more scientific, more real than anything that our science is putting forth today. There are some people, there's some people that have graduated from this school that are now pushing a flat earth deal. All you got to do is fly in a plane up at 35,000 feet and you can see the curvature of the earth. You can fly from here to England, which I do, and they go up over Canada because, uh, anyway, I'm not going to explain <laughs> all that. The Bible talks about that God sits on the circle of the earth. The Bible is more accurate. The Bible is not inaccurate in any of its details. It is God-inspired. Amen. Boy, that just gives me confidence. And I'm challenging you that I've just barely scratched the surface. You need to go research things. And there is plenty of information. As I said, thousands of scientists have come out against evolution. There is all kinds of research on this. There is just so much information. It's not hard to Hard to find if you're looking for it. And I, I challenge you, you've got to start believing in what the Bible says about creation in order to have a biblical worldview. And if you believe that all this stuff just happened accidentally, man, Satan is going to be able to lie to you on so many fronts, pull the wool over your eyes. You, this is something that you need to believe. Again, I'm going to start teaching this. I don't know exactly how we're going to develop it, but we're going to start teaching a biblical worldview and we're going to focus on youth, bringing youth in to counter the lies that they're being taught in our school system today. And we're going to start teaching these things. And we'll have people like Ken Ham or, or Dr. Ball or uh, Grady McMurtry, these people who are renowned scientists and stuff, and have them come teach these things that will give people confidence in it. Praise God. I just pray that... Uh, I know that there's people probably saying, boy, you are nobody. Who are you to counter all of these other people? It's not just me. I gave you so many quotes. I could have given you many, many more. But it's not just me. I challenge you. You need to go look it out. And plus, if you would just sit and listen to that homing device that God put in your heart, he has spoken and revealed himself to every person, every person in here on a heart level, your heart is bearing witness with what I'm saying. Your head may reject it because you've been taught something else.
But if you would just get quiet and let God speak to you, if you would lift up your eyes like this friend of mine did and say, where did all of those lights come from? If every one of these lights had to be placed, they didn't just evolve, then how did all of those lights get there? If you would ask questions like that, your heart would go to answering it for you. It would explain things to you. Amen. Father, we love you and we thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Father, for the word. Thank you for giving these things to Moses thousands of years ago, 4,000 years ago, and revealing these things. Father, thank you for not leaving us in the dark about this. Thank you for the revelation of the word of God. And Father, I just pray that people today that maybe have not stood strong in this area, I pray that this would embolden them, that they would take a stand, that this would convince them of the authority of the Word of God, that we would honor your Word more than we honor the Word of a man. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You know, I know that there's some people right here that in your heart right now, you're just making adjustments. You're saying, Father, I'm sorry for believing a lie, for just taking things. And God, the Holy Spirit right now is just helping some people to make adjustments, to change things. You need to make commitments in your life that I am going to stand on the Word of God. I am not ashamed of the Word of God. I am not ashamed of the truth. Your Word is truth. Thank you, Jesus. And I believe that there's some people that maybe have already believed these things, but you haven't had enough knowledge about it to be able to defend it. You wouldn't stand up for what is true. And God is speaking to some of you that you need to make adjustments. You need to get to where you can start letting the light and the salt of this earth do its job and release that preserving effect and touch people. Father, we just receive this and we make a decision that we are going to stand firm on the Word of God and be bold with it. Thank you, Father. Father, we agree and we receive this in Jesus' name. Amen.